Let us come together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, you have given us guidance in our faith by the words of the Gospels and all the books of the Bible. Be with us now as we reflect and as we hear again the stories that Jesus told and the story this morning of two people who went up to the temple to pray. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. There are three things on my mind as I invite you into a time of reflection during worship this morning. The first is happy anniversaries. Let us celebrate together. Anniversaries are such a rich and wonderful and delightful time to look back and to look forward. The second is prayer. We just heard another passage from the 18th chapter of Luke where Jesus teaches us about prayer. This is a story of two people going to the temple to pray. The passage from last Sunday was about a widow, a persistent widow, one who wore down the judge. And the other passage about prayer, which I want you to have in the back of your mind as we reflect this morning, is the passage recorded in more than one gospel where the disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us to pray. And quite surprisingly to me, at least, Jesus gave them the words to a prayer, the Lord's Prayer, which we continue, even in our time and place, to use as the basis for our approach to God and for our times of prayer together. But the third thing that I have in mind this morning is the future, and the future of St. Andrew's United Church. Jesus unquestionably taught his disciples, if not from the beginning, how to pray throughout their time of following him, enriched and helped them to grow and more fully understand what part a life of prayer could could play in each of our lives. And he did this mostly by example. Frequently, the Gospels talk about Jesus going off by himself. We don't know exactly what he did, but we knew that he was in the habit of praying on a regular basis Uh, at all times during his ministry here on earth. And I cannot help but feel that what Jesus taught his disciples mostly was by his example, by his presence. And not just as in that one passage I mentioned where the disciples came and said, teach us how to pray, was it by giving them the actual words of a prayer to say in their lives. I was six years old when my grandmother, my father's mother, came to live with us. I learned a lot from my grandma Dayfoot during the last 10 years of her life. I probably couldn't tell you before I was 16 and when she died just how much I learned from Grandma Dayfoot. Only when I was much older, I think, did I start to appreciate what she taught me. Grandma Dayfoot loved playing croconaw. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the game of croconaw. I hope that everybody has had a chance to play it at some point. And Grandma Dayfoot was good at it too. Playing croconaw with Grandma made me a much better player 
than I ever would have been otherwise. And I can say that in a bit of a boastful way because I've been in churches where they've had family games night, bring your board games, and inevitably, Crokinole is one of the games that comes when you invite everyone to come together with the board games they have at home. And I can't tell you if I have always been the champion in those church family games nights, but I have certainly been someone who others wanted to beat if they wanted to have any time, uh, opportunity to boast. Grandma never gave me instructions on how to play Crokinole. She never told me what to do. All she did was play to win every time I sat down with her. I learned that a good player does not always shoot the pieces as hard as possible. Sometimes you use lots of force. Sometimes it's a soft touch, which gets you a whole lot more points uh, otherwise. I learned that you have to hide behind a peg because you, if you left them out in the open, Grandma always knocked them right off the board. She rarely missed a shot. And so I learned from Grandma that in life, I need to make every effort count as well. But by far, the most useful and valuable life lesson from my Grandma David that comes to my mind quickly and easily was never buy lottery tickets. Just don't do it. And since Grandma taught me that I have never bought a lottery ticket in my life, I have spoken to people who, it seems to me, in one way or another, were hoping and praying to win the lottery. I don't know if I would call that a lesson in prayer or not, but it seemed quite sincere on their part. But it, in one way or another, and it was not always easy for me when I saw the Montreal Olympics arrive in 1976 and you could win a million dollars. I thought, surely grandma must be going to change her mind a little bit here. But nope, nope, not at all. Now, of course, before 1925, before the United Church existed, grandma was Methodist. She was a strict Methodist, just like St. Andrew's United Church before it was St. Andrew's. And being a strict Methodist, that meant no drinking, no smoking, no gambling. I'm not sure if everyone in my family, including myself, has learned the lessons that she practiced in her life quite so strictly. Nevertheless, starting off with that foundation was an incredible help and a security which enabled me to consider many of the decisions I made later on uh, much more carefully. In the gospel lesson we heard this morning, Jesus talked about prayer. It's not the passage where he gave us the words to pray. It was a passage where the, the writer of the gospel introduces by saying he wanted us to think about how it is we come to prayer and whether or not the attitude we bring to prayer reflects the ways in which we really want to communicate with God. He, the gospel writer says, some people think that they can be justified by their accomplishments and by all kinds of well, wonderful achievements. But after looking at the two people, he asks us to notice praying in the temple, the Pharisee, who stands up tall and speaks with a loud voice and speaks of others as though he is so much better than them, is not the one 
that Jesus invites us to pay attention to and to reflect on. The one who we are asked to pay attention to is in fact the one that's hard to find, hard to see, hard to hear because they are praying in a low voice. They are praying a very soft and sincere press. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And the th thing that strikes me the most about this and the passage that comes before it in Luke is that he never gave his disciples the words in this time to pray, but he gave them something about prayer which is far more meaningful. What you come to prayer like, the attitude you bring to prayer is so important. And the passage that came before, your willingness to be, to be persistent, to persevere, is so important because we all know when we speak from the bottom of our hearts and lift to God our honest desires, our deep desires, we don't know always whether or not those prayers are heard and received and answered in the ways that we are looking for. We might have to look for the things around us that are less conspicuous, that are harder to see, like the tax collector off in the corner who was not dr drawing any attention or attracting attention. God so often answers prayers in ways that we might never notice unless we are looking at the, our lives and the world in the hidden places, in the secret places, in the places that we don't often pay attention to. One time, and we're delighted for this, Jesus gave the disciples words to pray. And when he said, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven, even in the act of teaching him those words, Jesus did not teach them the kind of words they were accustomed to hearing. This was a prayer which stretched their imagination and asked them to look at God in new ways. Look at God in ways that the Pharisees and their religious leaders were not in the habit of showing to them. Our heavenly parent, our Father, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I want to close this morning with a prayer, a prayer that has come from St. Andrew's United Church. Over the summer Sundays, when I, in fact, was not here, I was absent, you started uh, pulling together ideas for what your prayer for St. Andrew's is in the future. And these ideas in those worship services were brought together by the transition team and were uh, written out and reflected on and prayed about and modified and changed again. And I'm going to read just about the first third of that prayer in closing of our time reflection this morning. Let us pray. Heavenly One, we invite you into this place. We ask that you fill us and our church with your Holy Spirit. Lord, as we venture in and out of seasons of change, loss, joy, and everything in between, we pray that you will grant us peace, that we will rest in your truth and know that you hold everything in your hands. Lord, we pray for your guidance as we move forward in search of a minister whose heart mirrors our own. We ask for your wisdom at this time that you will keep help and keep us through this transition period as we seek you and keep you at the center of all we do. 
Lord, hear this prayer and the many more and longer prayers that we lift to you today in this service of worship and in the coming days and weeks in the life of our church family. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.